Okay. So, today we are going to look at the last of the major compiler transformations that we need to understand basically software pipelining okay. and this is one of the things that has the most direct application in the context of the HLS design process. So, what I will be doing is first starting off with an example that can be related to HLS also explaining it in the context of pure software and then what we will do is we will switch over to the FFT problem that we already looked at and see a series of optimizations over there that will allow us to basically run the entire system at a much lower initiation interval than what we started with. So, to understand software pipelining let us look at a simple piece of code like this for i is equal to 0 i less than n i plus plus in other words essentially a for loop and what is being done inside this is something fairly simple let us say it is b of i equals some function of a of i okay that function could be as simple as just a of i plus uh, a constant or something like that okay we do not really care what that function is we are going to assume that the function is fairly simple and can be finished within one clock cycle okay now if i translate this into an actual implementation apart from the fact that i need to of course take care of the for loop right so in other words i need to do something which basically takes care of incrementing the counter comparing it against the limit and then deciding whether to branch or not all that is required in software but from a hardware point of view the actual computation is only what is going on over here right so if i assume that my for loop is actually going to be implemented by some kind of a state machine then effectively only this needs to get implemented as part of the computation inside the state machine okay now let's look at what this involves effectively there are three steps involved in executing a function like b of i equals f of a of i the first one is a essentially so what I have is that this can be considered as a for loop with first I need to read okay I am just going to call it a just write down read over there it is implicit that this is essentially getting the value of a of i okay then there is compute which is going to be the computation of f of a of i and finally I have write which is updating b of i okay. So, these three steps need to be executed in fact what I can do is I can go one step further and I can say I have a read of i compute of i and a write of i that need to be performed to indicate that they correspond to the ith iteration of the for loop okay. Now, let us further assume that each of these steps takes one clock cycle okay. So, in other words that is a reasonable assumption for certain types of memory basically I give the address and in the next clock cycle the data will be available okay. So, definitely a read operation will take one full clock cycle to execute in other words it cannot it generally speaking cannot be done combinationally I cannot expect that I give out an address and get back the data within the same clock cycle but giving out the address and getting back the data by the next clock cycle is reasonable for on chip SRAM giving out the data and getting back uh, giving out the address and getting back data might take several clock cycles if you are trying to read from DRAM but on chip SRAM you might be able to get it back within one clock cycle similarly writing something to an on chip SRAM can be finished within one clock cycle okay. So, with all of that in mind let us look at what the series of operations and the time steps that are involved over here is going to look like okay. So, if I have t right the operation is essentially going to go like this I will first have read 0 compute 0 write 0 followed by read 1 compute 1, write 1, read 2, compute 2 and so on okay which means basically that I have the latency and the initiation interval 
are going to be equal to 3 cycles. Okay. But what we can see over here is in principle at least these three things are working with different pieces of hardware or can be run independent of each other. Okay. So, it brings up the natural concept of what we already understand in terms of pipelining. Right. Can we do some kind of pipelining? Okay. The alternative for this would essentially have been to say I do read 0 over here right? and in the next clock cycle I can do compute 0, okay? but I will do that on another piece of hardware during which time the first one is free therefore, I can do a read 1 okay? and in cycle number 2 I can do write 0 during which I can do compute 1 and I can do read 2. Okay. So, this becomes a pattern I can do read 3 over here compute 2 and write 1. Okay. Eventually, it will go on up to read n minus 1 during that time I will be doing compute n minus 2 and write n minus 3 which means that I then need to finish the work. In the next clock cycle there is nothing no reading to be done, but I still need to do computation compute n minus 1 needs to be done here write n minus 2 will happen here and write n minus 1 will ha finally happen at this point. Okay which means that I can sort of isolate this block over here and say that this is the repetitive pattern. Okay. Right, but uh, and that goes on all the way up to here. Right. But there are two differences essentially what we need to deal with is one of them is in this corner and the other is in this corner out here. Okay. These are the so called special cases. Right. The term that is used for this is to say this is the prologue. Right. You will sometimes see this with or without the UE at the end depends on whether it is a European or American spelling. So, and similarly you have the epilogue at this end, okay. which the meanings of these words are exactly what they are in English. The prologue is something that happens before the main work, the epilogue is something that happens at the end after the main story has completed. right? So, what you can see in other words is provided that n is sufficiently large the overhead required for prologue and epilogue are small and the effective initiation interval that I have got over here is how much 1. Okay. Latency is still 3 because after I give a input it still takes 3 clock cycles before the write 0 happens. Right? I do a read 0 and only on the third cycle write 0 happens. So, the latency has not changed at all it cannot change fundamentally because of the nature of the uh, what needs to be done. Okay? But the initiation interval has come down from 3 to 1 basically what you are saying is since the other two the compute unit and the write unit are working with different pieces of hardware right? they could potentially be used together there are some implicit assumptions being made over here right if you look at this what is happening is this read and this write are happening simultaneously for that to happen they must have independent buses okay there should be some way by which i can give a separate address and data to the read uh, a of i and to the b of i okay in hardware that is relatively easy I can just actually have physically separate buses in software that is a bit uh, 
I mean it depends, you may or may not be able to do it depending on how your bus structure is. But the point is if you can do this effectively you can use this in order to bring down the initiation interval. Now let us look at what this looks like in terms of the software, right. How would I write this in the software? It is more or less like saying the for loop that I have, right, what is it doing at any given point in time? It is doing the read operation corresponding to i plus 2, not i. The compute operation corresponding to i plus 1 and the write operation corresponding to i, okay. Which means that of course, i should now run from 2 to n minus 2, right. And I need to also make sure that read 0 happens outside as well as read 1 and compute 0. Okay. What happens at the tail? I need to still finish compute n minus 1 and I need to do write n minus 2 followed by write n minus 1. Okay. So, effectively what happens is this is the prologue this is the epilogue and this is the loop body that can execute in parallel, okay, which is why you are effectively able to get an initiation interval of 1. So, you can see how even in the software side I could potentially have rewritten my code to look like this. Okay. It becomes useful only in a specific architecture where these three operations read, compute, write can be done in parallel. And it turns out there are a number of systems where that can actually happen. So, TI DSPs for example, were specifically designed around this idea. Okay, There was something called the, in fact there still is the C6000 series. They have a VLIW, very large instruction word. In a single instruction you can tell it to read something, do a computation and write something somewhere else. Okay. So, all three operations if they can be sort of combined into one instruction, then that allows you to basically parallelize loops of this sort. It turns out loops of this sort are actually very common in signal processing. Why? Because you can think about it any filtering is basically this, right. Instead of doing A of i plus something, it would be A of i into some value plus a constant. As long as your entire compute unit, the MAC multiply accumulate can be done as one unit, right, one operation, you can actually pull that off, you can get an initiation interval of 1.